checking the microphone is on. Yes? Okay. Uh, well, first of all, thanks very much to, to Nancy and uh, for the opportunity here to visit your, uh, your lovely campus and certainly your lovely city. I've been to Hong Kong several times, but uh, only just to stay for a few hours and uh, move on to the next place. So it's a pleasure to be able to spend a little bit more time here. One of the things I will say, however, if uh, you're at all familiar with Canada and with the landscape of Canada, I'm uh, from Edmonton, Alberta, which is uh, a fairly northern city within, on, closer to the west coast of the country, just on just east of the Rocky Mountains. And uh, we have what we probably best describe as a cool and dry climate. So when I'm in a place like Hong Kong, I feel like I should wrap myself in dehumidifiers just to make it through the day. But nonetheless, it's been uh, wonderful to be here. I'm going to talk about a few things that relate to learning analytics and why they're gaining so much attention in education. But I'm going to do it through a bit of a circuitous route to get to where I think we need to be in terms of thinking about what does this mean when we start looking at analytics as an alternative means for looking at teaching and learning and also for understanding what's happening in the educational process. I think it's probably not an inaccurate statement anymore to make the declaration that the world really is one big data problem. Everything from down to the basic details of our human DNA, how diseases are caused, how viruses spread around the world, how medical research is conducted, we're emphasizing the attributes of data in helping us make our decisions. Now this is certainly very pronounced in certain fields, such as business intelligence, where for probably over a decade now, individuals have transitioned to making decisions based on data rather than sort of flat level instinct. Certainly within medicine, it's a common uh, notion of evidence-based practice, where we're looking not so much at what a physician thinks or feels, but what does the data actually say. And there's some issues with that transition. It is the way the world is trending, but it's important that as educators, as we think about those trends, that we don't lose sight of the fact that we are sacrificing some aspects in the educational process that we may want to preserve. So we have to think carefully about the role that data and analytics plays in the educational process. Let me start by giving you uh, three quick examples that I think progressively indicate what's happening from a society perspective. The first one is an example of Man Gulch. Uh, you might be familiar with the work of uh, Carl Weick. And he's written about the Man Gulch disaster, which was a firefighter incident in the US. And this happened in 1949. And essentially what happened at that stage, at least for firefighting, uh, the way it would work is if you had a, a fire that couldn't be controlled uh, effectively through local means, you would fly in what was called smoke jumpers. And these were individuals that would come in on an airplane, they would literally parachute into this area, they would come in as a small cluster, a small team of individuals, and they were tasked with fighting the fire on ground rather because you wouldn't be able to fight it with local expertise necessarily. And so in this one incident, which Klein details, he looks at how does a small team that gets parachuted in very quickly turn into a disastrous situation. So in this case, after initial, initial parachuting, the head of this particular group ended up uh, sitting down on the grass when they landed, pulled out his lunch, started eating his meal, fairly relaxed. And so these quite a few of the individuals on this team had experienced. So this was new to them. So their cue that the way that they were making sense of the situation was based on how they were evaluating what their leader was doing. Now in a very short period of time, the fire burned out of control. It started leaping across the uh, gulches. And in the end, 13 people died, uh, 13 smoke jumpers died in this particular accident. And the only one of the few people that lived was actually the leader who had a little bit more experience. But this was an example of a situation <coughs> where learning was needed, where sense making was required, and yet the system broke down to such a point that uh, many lives were lost in the process. Another illustration, which some of you may have heard of, is the uh, Opal disaster in India. Uh, it's commonly referred to as uh, the largest industrial disaster in history. The numbers vary. It depends on what you look at in terms of you know, the actual numbers of individuals that were first killed at the first uh, wave versus individuals that died subsequently. And I've seen numbers that have varied from as low as 3,000 to as high as 100,000. So there's a lot of mystery around what exactly the count is, but I want to talk more so about the event itself, which was a uh, Union Carbide plant that over a period of time had been progressively reducing their uh, safety regulations, the training, and so they were pulling back 
how to respond to a disaster. And even a few months before this event happened, uh, where MIC uh, was released into the air, a uh, toxic gas that uh, you know, swept across the town, basically in the middle of the night, and resulted in these horrific uh, numbers of deaths. This situation had been anticipated by individuals who had recently visited the factory and said there was a huge you know, possibility, given that we change in security and change in, in privacy issues, that there's going to be a problem here. But unfortunately, uh, it wasn't heated, and the results were very significant. What you will see, though, in this illustration, the first one, uh, I mentioned Mad Gulch, was an example of a human social system thing. There's a group of people working together that didn't communicate properly, and in the end result, there was a significant uh, cost. The second incident I looked at here uh, related to the release of MIC into uh, the air, killing a huge number of individuals, was a social technical failure which meant that there were parts of the technical system that broke down, but there were social gaps or social structures in place that should, in theory at least, have prevented it from happening. Individual experts, the maintenance workers, should have realized as the water was backing up into the pipes, uh, into, into the tank that eventually released the gas in the air, uh, they should have realized something was going wrong. But unfortunately, the social system didn't sufficiently prevent the technical system from breaking. And, I'll, and then the third illustration I'll look at is a Black Hawk incident which occurred in uh, 1994. If you're not familiar with it, but this was a situation where the U.S. military shot down through, uh, two of their Black Hawk helicopters because of air inflammation by both the AWAC system but also by the pilots that were uh, flying the fighter jets that shot down the two Black now, without going into a lot of detail, basically the system was a uh, the Black Hawk incident was an example of multiple processes of security failure, or of uh, systems failure. Essentially, it's a technical system that broke down. The identification of friend and foe tags that uh, airplanes are supposed to have when they fly into enemy territory so that when a, a friendly fire or a friendly aircraft squawks at them, it should be able to reply back and say, well, one of you uh, don't fire on us. Uh, those codes hadn't been updated, particularly with Black Hawks. They had been updated on one mode, one channel, but not on the other one, and the pilots didn't use both. They used the one that hadn't been updated. Uh, the AWAC system recognized that, that these individuals were in the territory, but they failed to inform the fighter pilots, and the list goes on. This second illustration, this third illustration, is fundamentally a technical system that has begun to break down. And what I'm using these illustrations for uh, is that in many situations in our world today, we have a variety of incidents that once they've occurred, we look back at it, and there's a learning task or a learning need that, that has arisen. And as individuals, we're trying to make sense of why did this occur? We quite often know well in advance of a crisis. You know, after the financial disaster of 2008, there were many individuals that would tell us, uh, you know, that, that had written about it already, but that just hadn't been heard. And so systems break down. Why they break down is fundamentally a learning challenge. And from my perspective, I would argue that in society today, and this is something that the higher education system has to acclimate to, is that we're seeing greater reliance on sense making and learning that happens in systems rather than as individuals. So when we fail to learn, or when we fail to understand something, it's often a systemic breakdown, not necessarily a breakdown in teacher-learner relationships. So we have to reconfigure learning more so as a network process rather than an individualized activity. Now, I'm quite fond of the term sense-making because I think on many ways it covers the breadth of learning. It covers learning that happens as an individual trying to learn you know, a curriculum in a new course as they first enter undergraduate education. But sense-making is also what's happening at a conference like this, where all of you have different aspects of familiarity with what's happening in society. And so now you're looking at from an educational technology perspective, what does that mean? You know, what does it mean that your students are carrying around uh, mobile devices that have computation power that far exceeds a desktop computer from only seven or eight years ago? What, what are the implications of that? Uh, what are the implications, as, uh, as the dean mentioned in the opening talk, that students now have control, that the power resides with individuals in terms of technology, creating and accessing information? So when I use the word sense making, I'm looking at that spectrum from a novice learner right through to experts, faculty members, researchers that are trying to make sense of what does this mean and what are these things that are facing us going to do long term to, to the institution of higher education. So basically sense making then is a sustained effort where individuals want to understand connections. 
How do pieces fit? And what is the trajectory of those connections? What's the long-term implications? And we can't really understand how people learn unless we start to think about the broader system in which they're situated. For the most part, higher education over the past century or so, even longer going back, emphasizes a lot of attention on what happens in the school system. So what happens in the walls of higher education. But today for a student, you might teach one topic in a class, they'll go home and they might find a TED talk, or they might find a Google video, or they might join an open online course, or they might uh, go to uh, some other website to get videos, articles, or in some cases, they might follow that faculty member or researcher directly on Twitter, they might interact with them in other social media formats. So that's, I think, the reality that we face is that this clustered, closed, contained system of higher education uh, it was always a little bit of an anomaly. It wasn't really true. We were always learning in other spaces. But I think it's been laid quite bare that we have to now consider the broader system of learning and social interactions that go well beyond higher education. Now, I just want to provide just a quick illustration as I start to lead into analytics, what, what I'm referring to in this regard. Uh, in all the examples that I've provided, you have this continual flow of information. And this is very much the case educationally today. We live more in a world of activity streams than we live in a world of discrete clustered courses. So we're constantly seeing information washing across our desks. It's in our browsers. A lot of you have probably heard you know, blogs or Facebook for years before you possibly started using it. Uh, some of you have likely heard of uh, Twitter and other forms of social media and still aren't using it. Now that's not an issue. I'm just saying that this is, we, we get so much information across our desk we can't act on everything. So what we do instead is we, we're peripherally aware of what's happening, but we don't necessarily engage with it dramatically. But periodically an event happens. And that event uh, can be anyone that I've listed. You know, let's say the, the incident with uh, Opal or the situation that we had the Black Hawk shootout with others. These are situations where an event triggers us to see a new constellation of networks and connections. So what does that mean educationally? Well, I think it means that we have, for the last decade, heard an awful lot about digital media and technologies, and we've heard a lot about e-books, and we've heard about openness in education, we've heard about network science and network research, and it's getting to the point now where the system of education is starting to face enough significant shocks that people realize we have to see the system differently, and we have to look at the system differently. So in contrast with this year, where we have a variety of actions, you know, such as 2008 financial market and other situations. Uh, what we're looking at from analytics and sense making in is we really want to try to pick up these patterns of what's happening before the actual significant event occurs. So as educators, we want to be able to understand what's happening and what's occurring before the significant event happens that's going to render our university system obsolete. And so this is the problem that we face though from a social technical system perspective is that more and more of what's happening from society and and at the corporate end is that we're becoming technical and we're losing the social dimensions. There's a problem here, obviously, which uh, as uh, Vannevar Bush in his uh, famous article as we may think noted, we get so much information coming on that the important stuff gets lost in the mass of the inconsequential. We don't really know what's important and we don't know how to pick out what's important. If you ever had time to look through the data logs of a Moodle server or to look through the logs of a web server, you'll realize it's awfully hard to understand which one of these points and patterns are actually significant enough that we need to use this to take action or make decisions about what we do in our class settings. So within an educational context, we still need control points. We still need to be able to assert some level of structure for the learners, but these control points are very different than what the education system has had in the past. In the past, our control points might be enrollment, it might be the textbooks that we provide to students, it might be the assessments that we make them do. And today, in a distributed network world, those control points are incidental in a lot of ways. And, and really for us, a big question educationally is, how are you going to get to centralized aim? Aim to clear outcomes, clear learning activities, when you know that your students are running around in different forms and different network spaces. And the clear message that you hope they'll get from your learning outcomes may not be necessarily under your control. And in a lot of ways, the structure of the internet is actually antagonistic to the way that the university has been modeled. 
And if you start to look at the breadth of academic changes, and I'm not going to go into great detail in this talk, but there's an astonishing amount of change facing higher education sector administratively, in terms of content, in terms of teaching practice, in terms of models of assessment, even tuition models. These activities going on are really best described as the internet is happening to higher education. You know, we're seeing the fragmentation of content, fragmentation of social interactions, and that's producing a lot of the confusing sort of a difficult space where we're now trying to make sense of what it is that's happening. And in the con as, a, as a result of this, various organizations have uh, turned to more of an algorithmic view of the educational model. They're relying on models of analysis to give us insight into how we can understand this overwhelming quantity of data. And I'll get into that in a little bit. But essentially, our social systems for sense making don't scale with the scope of the abundance of information. And as a consequence of that, we're turning to different systems, different approaches to try and get a sense of what's going on. What's also driving this to some degree is the fact that there is a blurring of our virtual and our physical worlds. This is largely driven by mobiles themselves. So we have data lays that uh, you with Yelp or with augmented reality servers, and otherwise you interact with data in a physical world, uh, in, but in a virtual context, or vice versa. So we have a real challenge that in terms of what does it mean from a human perspective, especially if you've seen recently you know, holograms or holographic presentations that have been done for concerts or other areas that bring you know, uh, Tupac and others to life to present. There's this real sense that digital identity, time and space, and geo uh, geographical location are being questioned, primarily through, again, the mobile devices that most of us have in our these days. Now, another challenge, though, that makes this transition from sense-making as individuals to sense-making as part of networks and systems, from sense-making as a social activity to sense-making as an algorithmic activity, it's that we're producing an awful lot of stuff. And Nancy touched on this. And at the start of her talk, where uh, she mentioned that you know the, the octopus card, and apparently I don't know where the data was being sold, it only makes sense. I mean, if you've got data, it's an economic value point, why not sell it? But for those of you that are using any of the various social media tools, you're familiar with this already, but there's so many clicks on a given day that you're capturing and making available or put into a database somewhere that it boggles the mind. And you've probably heard the statement before, but if uh, if you are not paying for a service, then you are the product being sold. And you know that certainly holds true with Facebook and Twitter and otherwise. You know, it is free monetarily, but it's not free because you're paying with your data and that's what's being sold to other providers. Just like Twitter, for example. Uh, if you use Twitter, uh, you don't have access to your tweets after sort of a set period of time unless you capture them. But those tweets are all recorded and are being sold as part of huge terabyte data sets to people who might want a sentiment, uh, to do a sentiment analysis on, let's say, a company or the history of political activity around particular tweets and otherwise. So, huge increase in uh, the social analytics space as well. So, somewhere between this combination of growing complexity, increased technification, uh, at the abundance of technology, the blurring of physical and virtual worlds, people in various spaces have turned significantly to analytics. And they're using analytics as a way to try and make sense of what's happening in, in whatever field that they're involved in. And this isn't something that's wasted on the vendors. So if you have companies, let's say, like IBM, they have, since uh, 2005, invested more than $14 billion buying analytics-related companies. And they've also partnered with over 200 schools that are looking at developing analytics-related curriculum, which means that a lot of it most of this right now is centered in business spaces, the business intelligence field, but certainly the medical field, hospitals, and uh, governments as a whole. The military has been at this for a long time, and uh, education is really lagging behind, but it's finally starting to wake up to the influence that analytics might have and how we might understand what our students do in different classrooms and contexts. You know, as one example, this was a, a, a sort of a Netflix prize that you might have heard for building a better recommendation engine. But this is a Heritage uh, Prize, which is a Heritage Network, the healthcare network, basically issued a call, if you will, where the prize was $3 million for the best algorithms that will tell the system who's going to get sick. And the reason is, if the hospital knows who's going to get sick, then they can intervene before that person gets sick because it's a lot easier 
to practice preventative medicine than it is to uh, actually have somebody to hospital in need of help. So that's the simple model that they've adopted uh, to take a uh, $3 million uh, prize to help determine what fa factors will indicate or predict someone that might not be well. And that might be calls to a health line, calls to a company line to ask questions about insurance, uh, perhaps a visit to the hospital. All of this may well happen before an individual is hospitalized. So it's about anticipating that and being able to intervene in time. Now when you take that and you apply that kind of a model, so you see some elements of this predictiveness and the sense making in from learning analytics. When you take this approach in an educational context, we're trying to do several things. So analytics in learning then is really this process where we're trying to measure, we're collecting, we're analyzing, and we're recording data that relates to learners, the context that they're involved in, and we want to do this for a few reasons. Primarily, we want to understand what's happening in the learning process, but we also want to optimize it, both for the student, but also in some cases the environment. And so learning analytics is not necessarily a completely unique term. It's been around in a variety of different formats. Some of you have likely encountered it in the assessment space, which has a long history of uh, trying to understand what's going on with students. But the view of learning analytics then contrasted with two other analytics terms is on your screen. So on the one hand, educational data mining has been around as a unique field since about 2005, 2006, I believe. And the emphasis there is reducing components and analyzing relationships. So it's very much an algorithmically driven view. It's technical in orientation and it's reductionist. Academic analytics, in contrast, is what mostly you would see happening at a deans or at a VP level, vice president, uh, provost level within an organization. And that's where you're looking at data collection in order to improve the efficiency of the, the school or the university system. You want to have a better understanding of how does our university compare to other universities. Where are we wasting resources and how can we improve them? Uh, learning analytics, on the other hand, takes a systemic and a holistic view that incorporates not just the algorithmic or the technical details, but also the social and the contextual details. Now, all of these three, doesn't matter which one you're really looking at, they do share a data-intensive approach. They're primarily focused, or at least to a degree, are heavily focused on success of students and looking at ways that uh, we can better understand what's happening within the university system. By the way, if anybody is interested, uh, Nancy will have the slides, and I think she said they'll be posted on the site website. So uh, if, you know, if there's references that I've included, typically just listed in the notes portion of the page. Now, um, this data that we're producing educationally is an analytics on the show. So anytime you log into a library, anytime you log into a web browser, you log into a learning management system, you use a student card to access a particular system on site, you call a helpline for tutor support or whatever else. These are all data points, data traces that are related to your learning that potentially can serve as some kind of analytics activity. And it can be a breadth of them. So anything from learner success, it can be a matter of which university systems and resources do they do. There's a predictive component, you know, which of our students are at risk, which ones are doing well. Health seeking behavior, alerts, you know, early warning alerts, so you can intervene with students who are exhibiting traits of academic failure, potentially. Um, I did a workshop yesterday with, with Nancy's uh, group, I guess a few others across the university, uh, on learning analytics, and I mentioned uh, one college, Rio Salado, that is able to, by day eight, determine within a 70 plus percent accuracy rate which student will pass or which student will fail in the system. So eight days into a course, the signals that you exhibit as a student will be able to help them predict what you're going to do in the system support. There's a variety of things such as learner dashboards. Uh, I'm a strong believer, and I'll touch on this right away, but on uh, if you want students, or if you want to use analytics well, they have to be student-facing. Right? Analytics are not just for the institution, they're not just for the educator, uh, they're very much for students, because what we want to create, especially in an education system that's defined by those traits I started with, distributed, networked, systemic, you need autonomous focused learners that are able to take control of their own learning and recognize what their needs are. So we have to start developing the capacity for learners to make personal choices. If you look way back at, at Kant's definition of what enlightenment is, it's essentially doing for yourself what other people have done for you in the past. And 
in educational context, that's essentially what we're looking at, where we start to do for ourselves educationally what we used to rely on a faculty member to do for us. And the prevalence of tools of personal control certainly drives that. Other things as well, you know, real-time analytics where, uh, you know, technically in a class setting, uh, you'd be able to get immediate feedback from students. Are they understanding it? Are they not understanding it? And those kinds of things. Uh, one of the benefits of an afternoon talk, if you ever had the opportunity to do it, is you get immediate feedback from people nodding off. But uh, I'm looking at real-time technical feedback that will help you understand what's going on in a class context. And there's simple illustration. So in this case here, it's just a map that looks at student seating habits. So you're looking at which students are interacting with whom and, and how are they clustering around. You might want to know, you know what's happening in these particular spaces over here. Uh, what's the impact of the, the seating pattern with students over here and how does that relate to their academic success. Uh, you know, you're just really trying to find different ways of looking at data that's being generated one way or another in physical or virtual settings and using that as a means of determining what's the impact. Now there may be, you know, you look at things like this and there may be nothing here. I mean, that's part of the problem with a lot of visualizations is that they don't put the right labels on qualifiers on so you know what you're looking at. But anyways, if you want to look at the, the link is here, that'll give you better insight into this. But then you can start to look at how does physical world movements and habits relate to academic success, however you define academic success. Um, it might just be a student graduating course. If you have students that are more of an at-risk profile, you might have an entirely different definition of, of success than, let's say, a traditional university setting. Or you might look at something like this. This was a network analysis of a course that I taught in 2008. It was uh, one of the first, they're not called MOOCs, but it was a massive open online course. And uh, so I looked at an analysis of how students are interacting with each other. So there's a few things that you can see. You might wonder, you know, what does this actually mean? And I should emphasize, a good analytics activity should cause you to ask more questions. Right? An image like this doesn't answer many questions. If it's effective, it will cause you to ask more questions. So you see a few things. I mean, on the one hand, these are students over here that really don't seem to be connected to anyone else. Uh, you have a few here. You see central nodes over here. That's interesting. Um, and I should mention, you probably don't see it at the back, but when you, if you're interested, we'll have the slides. But you'll see over here, there's a little number that tells you how frequently people interacted with one another, and also the flow of the interactions. In this case, this person commented twice on a post that this person had uh, made and in this individual here, however, doesn't look like he or she replied to anyone else. So you start to look at those things and you ask questions. Why? You know, what's the nature of the interaction? What are they talking about? What does it mean that these students aren't connecting, these students aren't connecting? So your first question was something like this could be around what's the content that they're talking about. Your second question might be who's doing well in this class? If you find that you know, these students are all performing below average. And if you find when you do an analysis of, let's say, the learning management system forms, that uh, these people aren't logging in regularly. They're logging in once a week. Uh, they're doing the readings, but they're not involved in discussions. And you might, if you have a data set previously that you've looked at, I would say those are all indications of students who are at risk. And the reason they're at risk is, especially if you take a social pedagogical view of the learning process, you would recognize that research strongly emphasizes the discursive nature of effective learning, this notion of knowledge generation and knowledge building. So these would be, if nothing else, I would look at it, I would want to understand what's happening with these students. Are they at risk? Do I need to intervene or do I need to do something to help them succeed? This is another, just a simple visualization where you start to, and again, this was a, we had 178 participants in this one forum, 431 posts, and uh, this is odd, I thought anyway. We had one person that posted 46 times. The second most frequent poster came in at around 13 times, right? So there's a very, there's a very different leverage of, of interaction. And then as an educator, your questions are, why? What's happening here? Is this person um, being aggressive in the posts? Are they dominating the conversation? Or are they just a very effective person at connecting with other people? You don't know that until you look at it in more detail. But then when you start to look down, you very much have what's commonly called sort of the long tail effect. But you see a few people posting numerous times, but then all of a sudden you get over here and we have, you know, the vast majority of our participants in this form, starting here, who posted three times, here we posted two, and here only posted once. Now if you've only posted once, then chances are you've done an introduction, but you haven't replied to anyone else, you haven't interacted. So you might find, and this is where the value is, you might find that as you design what you're going to evaluate or your 
marketing, you might ask individuals to you know, build that into your marketing activity where you're saying, you know, you have to reply to two or three individuals' posts, or you might ask them to work more so in groups and to look at they're interacting with smaller clusters, maybe they found this group a bit too large. But these are very, very basic visualizations of analytics that anyone can do with a simple spreadsheet. And I would mention as well, in one study that looked at what's happening in companies with analytics, uh, Excel is still the number one analytics tool, right? You know, where you take your data and clean up your columns and do a simple visualization or representation. There are far more complex tools available, but it's still something that we're familiar with. Um, now, this isn't all good necessarily, because in education as well, some universities, administrators, uh, they often love numbers. And uh, what ends up happening is, in this case, University of Texas decided they were going to take a new plan where they wanted to get a better sense of which faculty members were doing well and which ones weren't. So they're making the data about faculty performance transparent. So quite often we think learning analytics and we think, well, that's great, now we'll know what our students are doing. But it goes further in that, well, now they will know what the faculty are doing. So it might be, in this case, public dashboards that are interactive that let students and parents and others know which faculty members are doing well, which departments are doing well, which systems are performing, and uh, which ones aren't doing well at all. Now, this, is, this was a, a big uproar, obviously, because it's for faculty. It's OK if we assess others, but it's a little bit different if we get assessed ourselves. And so that was part of the issue that came out of it, a bit of pushback. But don't think for one moment that the next stage of analytics, once we've got the learning analytics around students addressed a bit more fully, that faculty and research performance are the next ones that will be visualized and made publicly available. I'm um, not sure how many of you have heard of this site. It's called the Quantified Self. I'm just giving this to you as a simple illustration. Uh, Quantified Self essentially is a website that has a list of tools that helps people measure themselves. Their diet habits, their health habits, their everything you know, from your heart rate, your lifestyle, the medicine, to money, their relationships, to how you sleep, you name it. These are basically apps that you can install. Some you can have on your iPhone by your bedside, which will track you know, your snoring habits and other things. <laughs> um, but these are just for track me, which just allows you to know where you're driving, so people who are connected, you can make sense of how you're moving around. Uh, you know, weight loss, your meditation happening. There's a whole lot of things going on here. And this is, I would, I would be comfortable saying that this is what we can possibly see happening from a learning perspective. So that you know, down the road we will have you know, a learnified self where we have tools and resources that can track our study habits, our, you know, our comprehension, our development, how well we're connected. Now, on the other hand, though, and I just want to give you a, a quick example from a video end about the importance of seeing uh, that when we're looking at, a step back here, when we're looking at things like the quantified self, where we're self-evaluating and we're understanding how we're related to others, there are details that are involved in the learning process that require us to be constantly interacting and connecting with other people. <coughs> Tools like quantified self can often form those relationships for us. Recommender systems that you might have seen on Amazon or perhaps on Netflix, but they look at who you are in your profile and they compare it with other profiles and then they provide you with uh, a, you know, a recommendation. So here's just a quick example from a learning sense about the importance of being connected or interacting with others in, in a certain way. Let's try that again. Because good ideas normally come from the collision between smaller places. Good ideas are all something bigger than themselves. So you see a lot in the history of innovation, cases of, of someone who has half of an idea. There's a great story about the invention of the World Wide Web in Tim Berners-Lee. This is a project that Berners-Lee worked on for 10 years. But when he started, he didn't have a full vision of this new medium he was going to invent. He started working on one project as a side project to help him organize his own data. He scrapped that after a couple years, and he started working on another thing. And only after about 10 years of the full vision of the World Wide Web coming to be in, that is, more often than not, how ideas happen. They need time to incubate, and they spend a lot of time in this partial hunch form. The other thing that's important when you think about ideas this way is that when ideas take form in this hunch state, they need to collide with other hunches. Oftentimes, the thing that turns a hunch into a real breakthrough is another hunch that's lurking in somebody else's mind. You have to figure out a way to create systems 
that allow those hunches to come together and turn into something bigger than the sum of them. Okay, so uh, that's just a simple example, and you can understand sort of the role that analytics can play in this regard, because in a lot of cases we socially connect to each other, but what's happening through the technologies that we now have at our fingertips, they're automated in terms of how they draw connections. So they may recommend things that we might want to read based on our profile of learning. They may give us insight into other individuals that we could possibly connect with, or in some cases, you know, another course that we should take in, in a particular program. So that'll tell us that, well, you did well in this course, uh, George, you're gonna like this course as well. So it can help ensure academic success. If it's created properly, it should also give us opportunity for serendipity. We can't script creativity. <coughs> there needs to be opportunity for those random connections uh, that come out as a result. Now, one of the, the aspects that I've been involved with over the last few years has been this notion of open online courses. And they've gained a fair bit of attention in the, uh, I guess, the last seven, eight months in particular. In fact, with Udacity, Coursera, edX, the Harvard-MIT initiative, there have been about $100 million worth of funding that's been allocated to these open online courses. And I think there's a prospect that they're going to dramatically change the educational process. One of the things that works very well with these courses is these are half-baked ideas, if you will, that are colliding with each other in an open forum. And if you look at some of the literature on participatory pedagogy, I think you've probably encountered this notion that students need to be responsible for providing some of the resources. Right? The educator shouldn't provide the full model of learning. Students should participate through wikis, through blogs, social media, in contributing to those resources. And personally, my own view is that any learning experience that requires a student only to consume is an incomplete learning experience. Uh, our curriculum shouldn't be structured so that the only thing left for students to do is consume what we've written. Because students need the ability to create, they need to create artifacts, they need to remix things, they need to pull new pieces together, and they need to focus on sort of novel models of connectedness. And some of the courses, as I mentioned, that I've been involved with uh, are at the top here. Um, but there's other ones now with the MIT and the Stanford and others that are getting 130 to 160,000 students per course. So those are astonishing numbers. Actually, the, the student bases, though, are actually coming not from US, Canada. They're coming from other parts of the world, India, Africa, China. Uh, those are the regions where certainly the courses like in artificial intelligence, the technical courses, they're bringing in astonishing numbers. Now, in some cases, Udacity, for example, if you take a course with them, you can now validate that course by taking, uh, you can test it through a Pearson Testing Center. Or you can now start to take these uh, open online courses, and they'll send you a certificate of completion. And if you know the instructor, you know the rigor of the course, you may find that certificate of completion as an employer is sufficient where you don't necessarily need an academic degree. Because a lot of this, what's happening is that we're participating in these self-organizing, decentralized systems. And all of us in this room, if we were to sit down, there's an awful lot of intelligence in this room because we don't all know the same things. If we all knew the same thing, we'd sort of have a, a target of intelligence, and that's where we'd stay. But if you have a course set up where students are encouraged and where the system recommends different types of interactions, then you have the benefit of people filling each other's knowledge gaps. One of the studies I did on the open online course I taught in 2008 was uh, how long does it take for students to answer each other's questions, right? Because quite often in a classroom, the faculty member answers the questions for the students. So in this case, I was looking at, well, how long does it take? Because there's, it's important to emphasize, the most I've had in an open online course is just over 3,000 students, so well below the 160,000 that Stanford's in. But what I found, even in those small course settings, is that you as an instructor cannot teach 3,000 students, right? It's, the reason this model works is because students are self-organizing and teaching each other. Uh, that's why participatory pedagogical models are so effective. Um, I'll skip that, and um, I'd like to save at least 15 minutes for questions or so. So a big thing that happens in these social systems is what we're looking at is self-organizing activity. Sort of this, this thing merging kind of models that emerge, you know, much like you might have insects, for example, that are able to sense and leave data trails for others to sort of track and follow. 
Uh, that's what's happening in these self-organizing models. Now, one of the things that find, I find most fascinating about this is this notion of synchronization, right? Because one of the things that happens if, for some of you, what I've said today may have resonated. You might have said, yes, that makes sense. I've had a similar experience. So if you have a comparable experience or comparable areas of interest, those ideas may make sense. For some of you, you might have said, oh, I, I should have probably just said that. So in that case, it's that you know it's, there are certain areas that maybe didn't resonate with you, and your thinking wasn't necessarily at that level. Maybe it was well past, or maybe it wasn't there. So when we're talking about synchronization, here's the best example I've come across when I try to communicate: How is it that learners align themselves to one another? Right? How do things resonate with each other in these kinds of settings? So for this quick video here. What you have here, I sort of mentioned briefly what you have here, you've got a group of robots, duh. And um, so what you're gonna see is somebody will clap to start and they'll immediately recognize each other and they'll act in unison. Then this one robot gets interfered with and then the robot is out of sync because now it tries to interact with the person interfering with it and it begins to duplicate what that person is doing when it gets put back down. Not just does this robot begin to sink again, but this entire cluster of robots actually slows down until this person is caught up. So that's just a quick view of what you're going to see. The other thing I will say is, you know, I don't know how many thousands of years it's taken humanity to have dancing robots. And we get dancing robots, and this is the first song we teach them. <laughs> Technosocial models 
because we begin to rely more and more on technology to give us the patterns of what's happening and then they're presented to us and we try to make sense of that. However, I do want to emphasize that we need to make sure that this is rooted in learning sciences and it's rooted in sort of the experiences and the learning activities of individual students, especially as we go forward with this model. Now the last slide that I'm going to present here, and I'll talk to you a bit of infomercial on stuff I'm involved with, you might be interested in, but um, this is sort of looks at the process from a university model. What are some of the things that universities and schools need to think about as they start looking at deploying or developing an analytics model? I presented an analytics model uh, yesterday uh, during a workshop, and I believe that will be posted on, or Nancy has the slide, so I believe those will be posted on the site as well if you want to look at sort of the data model that universities go through. But here's typically the things that you want to look at. You know, the institutional strategy. I found very, very few universities that have a broad learning analytics strategy. And that means that they're not thinking about, you know, a data inventory, right? What kind of data does our institution have? Who are the stakeholders that need to be aware of that data? How do we access that? Everything from governments to compliance. This is an area that I've very rarely seen. Most often what happens, a faculty member or a department starts a learning analytics activity and is not tied strategically to the university's success, which is quite unfortunate. Uh, the other aspect is actually doing the analytics. So this is the, the planning and the resource allocation. This is the data analytics team, where you're going to get your sources, your budget. The priorities, what kinds of questions are you actually asking through your analytics activity? Uh, what do you need to know? Is your priority stopping student attrition or is your priority something entirely different? Identifying, you know, exceptional performers so that you can move them into other systems. And a few other things around policy development as well. Uh, metrics and tools, again, this is something that a lot of cases is just done by what you have experience with. So if you're a faculty member and you used SPSS in doing your undergrad or your, your graduate research, then chances are that's going to be one of the first analytics tools you turn to. Um, it's also a matter of educator control tools. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of systems that are prescribed and only controlled by, let's say, central IT departments. I think the end user needs to have drill down reporting as well as set structure reporting as well. Uh, a few other things I won't get into. Uh, capacity development is huge. I find that even in a university where we pay a lot of attention to the scientific method, we emphasize empirical data. In a lot of cases, the faculty and universities just don't have the capacity to be able to use analytics well in how they teach and they learn. Uh, they may use it well in their own discipline, but that same scientific methodology isn't necessarily practiced in their teaching. And then the other end, of course, is this notion of systemic change. Right? You know, we're looking at different kinds of models for courses. Right? Where we're no longer, you know, you take this course instead, we fragment all the content pieces small enough so that you don't even take a course, you just engage in a learning ecosystem and after a period of time you've met the IRB requirements and criteria and you graduate, if you will. It's also self-directed learning. Again, I strongly advocate the importance of the individual student being autonomous in control of their learning. Automated discovery, this is where the, the, uh, uh, the system will automatically tell, send out alerts, otherwise that will give me an indication of what I need to do differently. Uh, or, or that might provide the educator with you. have six students out of the 150 you're teaching this month that are at risk, uh, you need to send them for help. And that help might be tutoring or it might be uh, you know, go to the library or get writing help. Uh, and then another point is this notion of intelligent curriculum. Again, I touched on that a little bit more yesterday, but if uh, as the world gets more complex, all of our knowledge structures or our knowledge domains have a structure. So once you start looking at semantic technologies, what we're really doing is clearly articulating that structure and the connections between those elements so that a technical system can understand it the same way that a human system can understand it. Once a technical system understands those, the knowledge structure of a particular field, then that system can begin to personalize and provide uh, relevant or appropriate health resources to individual students. Final few slides. This is the, the promotion piece. Those of you that are interested in analytics, our next conference is held in Leuven, in Belgium, uh, next year. So you go to the Learning, the Black Learning Analytics and Knowledge Conference site for more information. There's also a practitioner's workshop being held on the same topic in uh, October, and if you're interested. Uh, this is an open online course that I'm doing uh, starting October the 8th. 
Uh, we're looking specifically at the future of higher education. So uh, what's happening, basically some of the things I touched on, right? The different tools, different technologies that are changing, how we learn, how we teach, how curriculum is created and shared. Uh, at least this is obviously free, so anybody that wants to join uh, can sort of join in. There's no fee attached to it. And I think we have about nine minutes for questions. And so now when you want analytics, what's happening, and I've seen this with many systems now, 
universities are now buying Lucian uh, approaches, or they're using starfish retention solutions, or they're using Blackboard analytics, those kinds of things. And in some cases, they don't even get to see the algorithms behind the scenes, which really drives me nuts. Because if I want something done, I want to know what are you analyzing, how are you weighting what you're analyzing, so that I can perhaps tweak it. Maybe I have a different student base. Or maybe I find that there's an ethical issue with you even doing that level of analysis. So I, I think you're 100% right. There are significant ethical issues, and I think it's 100% the responsibilities of researchers and academics to make sure that that concern is reflected as universities begin to deploy on this. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, if I remember correctly, FMS is one of the leading uh, online courses, uh, I mean, online degrees in Canada, uh, the University of Canada. I think. Uh, is there an advantage? Just a kind of curiosity, is it an advantage to us the uh, leading, uh, sorry, learning analytic from the point of view for being such an advanced university, or is it similar cases just uh, with other universities? Yeah, no, that's. I think you're raising a good question there because yeah, online universities or even universities that do a lot of e-learning activity have a greater quantity of data on the breadth of the student learning experience. So we have a better opportunity for analytics because we have that scope. By the same account, almost all universities I've interacted with over the last several years are digitizing a greater and greater percentage of student interaction. Now what I mean, it could be the, uh, the use of library services, it could be your, even your enrollment in your course selection, it could be what you capture as a student information system, it could be that even existing courses that are 100% classroom based might have readings online or discussions online. So right now, student systems like Athabasca, Open University, and others that are online will have greater scope of data on student performance. But if you, and I, I suspect not the things in the University of Hong Kong are essentially the same, which is greater and greater quantity of student activity is now leaving a digital trail even from what it did a few years ago. I think there's questions over here somewhere. I'm not sure who has the mic, and I'm not sure how much time we have. Time for one final question. OK. Students have to pause and think. 
So it's probably the thinking that results in the improvement. But it's that kind of thing where we can look at where in our curriculum should we have students pause and do an activity based on the analytics. Right now, when we an instructional designer or a learning designer plans an activity, they typically say, hmm, okay, we've just taught this, now they should do something to practice it. Well, maybe that's not the right place. So we're making a lot of gut instinct decisions rather than making a decision based on what's actually happening with student performance. So I think from a quality end, both in the design of learning and the design of curriculum, and even in our teaching practices, analytics can help improve the quality of the doing. But again, it's all a matter of context and situation in which we're using these approaches. Thank you, Dr. Stevens. Can we get another big clap?